I guess the microphone is a bit nervous like me. Um, so before this uh, event, I got some uh, uh, suggestions from my friends and some questions that, uh, you know, what would it feel like to be sitting at two of the brightest minds in the world? So are you nervous? I said, no, not at all. Because my job is basically to just hand the microphone to two of them to answer questions. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm with my guests good afternoon. Uh, it's been a privilege to be invited here to moderate this uh, panel discussion with two of the best uh, minds in the world. So uh, I prepared tons of questions, actually, and we, we keep coming in because uh, for the audience, if they scan the QR code, they can just upload their question too. But we only have uh, like an hour, so I'll try to confess. So my first question is to um, Professor Andrew Ong, or I uh, can address you, Andrew, it's fine. Um, as one of the leading figures in the AI field, I, I think people around the world look up to you for advice and suggestions, and I think they'll ask you a lot of questions. Should you like ChatGPT, right? So you come up with questions, uh, but this time it would certainly be right, right questions. So I, I think um, that's, uh, uh, to re respond to that, you, you play multiple roles, because you're a professor at Stanford and uh, you were a director and uh, researcher at Google and Baidu before, right? And also you are an investor at uh, um, AI Fund, and also you're an entrepreneur that co-founded uh, uh, Coursera and now Lane AI. So there are multiple roles. So I'm just curious, that which role or roles do you enjoy most? Yeah, let, let, I, so one of my friends, um, that friends with them for 15 years, old friends, they recently were you know, concerned about my health because they saw us working really hard and they actually asked me, they said, this is a good friend, so they really cared about me and uh, they knew me when I was not known at all, so I trust them. They said, hey Andrew, why do you do this to yourself? Why do you work so hard? Like, go on a holiday or whatever. And actually, because it's an old friend, I actually did some soul searching and actually realized I love what I do. I think, I think the complexity of getting to help many learners around the world to support entrepreneurs to build these exciting things and then see other people succeed and see them build things that go on and are used by billions of people. Um, I really am fortunate to find that on a Sunday the most exciting thing I could be doing is you know, I'll go to a bookstore and I'll sit in a bookstore and work all afternoon and, and I'll go home and play with my kids, try to be a good father too. But that's really what, what, what I enjoy most doing in my spare time. Okay, uh the artificial general intelligence, or AGI, may be decades away, like you mentioned uh, yesterday and the, the day before yesterday. But I think we see the uh, human general intelligence in you. They can switch from rows to rows, multitasking. So that has already happened. Um, speaking of the generative AI, especially the ChatGPT this year, it has made uh, lower the, the entry barrier for the general public to use AI a lot. So it's no longer for nerds and kids, but for moms and dads as well to use AI. But also there are issues associated with this, that uh, like the data privacy, security, and also the data bias and discrimination issues. So to move forward with the AI research and application, what are some of the uh, issues that need to be addressed before we move forward? So I'd like to start the question first with Audrey. Okay, yeah. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think by far people mostly uh, worry about overly reliant on something that we don't fully understand, the opaqueness uh, that is the problem. Uh, and just to continue uh, from uh, Andrew's excellent slide, uh, for example, pandemic, it real, really is a societal wide risk. And in the previous pandemic, in COVID-19, we have seen that social media was supervised learning about getting people engagement and clicking on things that keeps them on the social media websites. Sometimes it added to the pandemic with something that the WHO called infodemic. That is to say, in many jurisdictions, uh, there's like anti-vax, there's many like um, ideas that just spread thanks to partly to this AI that is supervised learning to keep people engaged uh, with a narrow and narrow polarized set of people. And that actually uh, increased the toxicity of the pandemic during the COVID-19 because people would not uh, get vaccinated or would not get cured because of the ideas uh, that they received uh, from that AI that intense on cell engagement. And so just that one simple idea. Before the conversation uh, started here, uh, we were talking about how more 
algorithmic transparency and accountability should be ascribed to social media companies using previous generation, not generative AI yet, supervised learning. And I think just we are now currently waking up to the fact that it has wide-ranging societal harms, so should we just focus on a race to safety so that this time around with Gen AI and other next generation AI technologies, we can surface those societal harms uh, before they become like truly uh, pandemic, truly uh, global. Thank you, Audrey, and the same question for Andrew too. Uh, the, the issues then need to be addressed before we move in AI forward. Yeah, the solution is, I think, algorithmic transparency, and maybe I feel like, um, you know, chatting with Audrey just now made me feel better about what, what Taiwan seems to be doing on transparency, and I'm actually very concerned if I look at the regulatory landscape in the United States and in, and in Europe, candidly, at the degree of regulatory capture that I see underway right now. So I feel like um, uh, governments, you know, say explicitly US and I think um, European, US certainly, where I've been in a few conversations, um, governments does not have a good view of what is actually going on in many of the companies. And I know this because um, most governments and even citizens don't have data to know what are the harms are actually taking place. If we look back and look at the bad things that happened in tech, even the last generation of tech, often we didn't find out about the bad things that happened, like Cambridge Analytica or whatever, until years later when there happened to be a whistleblower or a researcher happened to discover a result. So in Silicon Valley, I have heard of worrying things that some Gen AI companies are doing, a small number, uh, not, not the largest ones, but a little bit smaller, but still, and, and I feel like I hear rumors about possibly disturbing things that, that could be harmful for the information ecosystem. Um, and I'm pretty sure they're true because my friends, I think, will tell me the truth, but I'm pretty sure the US government is not aware of these and currently lacks the levers to gain the transparency to even identify the problems so they can then do a better job protecting against them. So that, that actually, and I feel like I would love for thoughtful regulation to help move it forward, but I'm quite concerned that we're proceeding down the path in some countries where the regulations to be passed would be ones of regulatory capture, which would be worse than, than no regulation. Or do you have anything to echo or to add? Yeah, uh, just to expand on the idea of regulatory capture, uh, which is basically uh, certain very large companies uh, prescribing a set of algorithms or rules uh, that um, actually benefits only established large players uh, and that makes startups much harder uh, to navigate. Uh, in addition to that sort of regulatory capture, I would also say that sometimes uh, the liabilities are not properly uh, assigned. Like in Taiwan, we were just talking about uh, if, for example, Facebook, if they uh, have this uh, advertisement uh, that they do not make public in their ads library, they now do, uh, but before we changed the law, uh, they could not give the kind of transparency to the civil society organizations to see uh, which kind of financial scams or investment advices and so on, where did they come from, how many people they reach, and so on. And now with transparency uh, and with the mandated liability, we changed the law for that. If Facebook does not provide this kind of transparency and antiquity and somebody gets scammed for, say, one million, then Facebook is now in Taiwan uh, also responsible for that one million. And so this kind of externalities, this moving fast and accidentally breaking things, uh, we need to uh, make sure that these things that were broken are measured in real time. And the legal system needs to respond to the harms, not just financial, but also non-consensual intimate images, uh, meddling around elections with deep fakes and so on, are properly re-internalized. So I always think a social evaluation risk, risk and a good liability framework is better than this kind of top-down guardrails uh, that protects the established uh, companies. And, and the crazy thing about risk assessment is that then a new startup ecosystem can form around assurance and around mitigating the risks. Okay, since you both mentioned about the regulation, so I'm interested, how do you strike a balance between innovation and the regulation? Because innovation without regulation could be disaster. Supposedly, you know, many private institutions can get access to the uh, radioactive material and make it a you know, nuclear bomb or atomic bomb will be a disaster. But you know, too much regulation will kill innovation. So how do you reach the balance between the innovation and the regulation, especially regarding the AI development? So, Andrew? Young regulator, not me, so you take that. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. No, I mean, if we think of um, AI as the new electricity or 
fire, or there are many like general purpose technologies, there are actually regulations uh, around how safely to process uh, electricity uh, to safeguard against fire, especially if there's a new kind of technology that makes previously not flammable materials suddenly flammable. Uh, we will have to do a lot of infrastructure redesign and rebuilding. And something is happening like this. Uh, Andrew mentioned that it's not general purpose AGI, but there are narrow um, circumstances where, for example, I'll just use one example, cybersecurity. Uh, previously, in order to make a full like kill chain, uh, you will have to remote control right, your Trojan horses and so on in the target network. But now we're seeing a new crop uh, called living off the land, meaning that it synthesizes new malware, even new zero days, using the intranet computational resources uh, that they have infiltrated into. And so instead of being remote controlled, which you can defend using advanced threat detection and monitoring tools, this kind of attack uh, is almost undetectable because this is like sending a hacker a red teamer uh, into your own network and start working there. And for this kind of semi-autonomous or even fully autonomous, they do not have to be AGI. They don't have to you know, pass all the exams. They just have to be really good at synthesizing malware. Uh, and so we will have to then switch instead of you know, just relying on passwords uh, to switch to zero trust architecture to always verify the fingerprint, the device, the behavior, and so on, so that when those newly synthesized autonomous uh, agents uh, break one door, uh, we can detect its presence instead of it replicating uh, to other places in the intranet. There are many domains where this kind of new AI is making an asymmetric, uh, making the attackers easier and the defense not that easier. And so we need to identify these places and set up regulations to, for example, mandate zero trust authentication and so on, as we have done so in the telemetry public sector. Yeah, thank you, Ojak. Mm -hmm. And since you probably have been nervous, because speak quite fast. Okay, I'll, I'll, slow down. I'll speak back when I'm nervous, so right now I'm okay, you're not. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, Andrew? Uh, so, uh, just one, one observation. I find that um, regulating products may be more fruitful than regulating technologies, because if we try to regulate the automotive industry, you know, there are certain outcomes we want, um, like safety, and certain outcomes we don't want. Um, and we're regulating financial services, there are certain outcomes we want. We want people to have access to loans or whatever financial services on fair terms and certain outcomes like fraud or scams and receiving things that we don't want. And so I actually find in terms of regulating frameworks, uh, regulating products or specific industry verticals, uh, where we can more clearly articulate the outcomes seems to be a promising approach, whereas if you regulate the technology, technology is a general purpose technology, so that seems much harder to, to, to do so to do effectively. Okay, and also uh, for two the AI research and development requires a lot of resources, whether it's uh, financial resources or it's talent resources or the computing resources. So among the 200 countries in the world right now, only a handful of countries can afford to do that. So my question is that, uh, should there be a global initiative among countries to join develop AI? So instead of you know, re reinventing the wheels you know, repeatedly. So what, what do you think, Andrew? You know, I think international collaboration um, among like-minded places with similar values, I think that, that, that's a uh, very welcome um, uh, addition. Um, and I think you, know, you, you saw me prompt, right, build a sentiment classifier in seconds, um, and that costs a tiny fraction of a cent. Uh, and so there are actually some things that, you know, a, a high school student, right, with a five US dollar credit card budget could do a lot. Um, and then, the, 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 so the different tiers of technology, it turns out that what I was doing was called prompting, uh, very cheap, lots of people use it. Uh, the next layer up, there's a technology called fine tuning, where you can take one of the OMs that someone has trained and adapt it to a specific use case. So one of my engineers took an open source um, large language model that Facebook Meta had released, and I think it cost him 10 US dollars to fine tune it, so a lot of um, things I had said to make the OM sound a lot like me. So, yeah, kind of strange. I think we've yeah, been using that to reply to emails since at least uh, April, right? Uh, and I have a Hugging Face account uh, for that. But anyway, uh, and, and just to continue that thought, uh, I think I want to push back a little bit about 
uh, this assumption that it requires a huge centralized uh, cloud data center in order to train or fine tune AI. It is true for the largest pre training for sure, but because of the existence of Llama and Falcon and other open source models, fine tuning unquantized data can be done in personal computers. And, and I know this because I do this on my MacBook all the time. Right? So I, I got this MacBook earlier this year with uh, 96 gigs of RAM and VRAM. It doesn't make a difference for them to architect. And I've been um, very successfully doing a lot of fine tuning because even the largest language models and vision models fit on a USB stick because they have to fit uh, on the virtual ring. And with 96 gig, I can just quantize it to two bits or three bits for the largest models and still do useful fine tuning uh, here. So I think we're at a like Arduino moment uh, or a Raspberry Pi moment uh, or Android moment here in that uh, over the next year we will see more and more uh, of this use of edge AI and edge fine tuning because after all um, nobody wants to upload their sensitive data personally. For me it's just emails uh, to the cloud uh, processes without very strong uh, technological guarantee like homomorphic encryption which is even more expensive uh, than this edge AI fine tuning. So but I think there were two times in my life that I think I controlled the world's biggest um, AI supercomputer. I, I built two of those in my life, maybe three, not sure. But very soon, within six months, you know, I was far from still only the world's biggest AI computer. So we do see, I think, to, to, to all his point, today's supercomputer is tomorrow's pocket watch, and I think we're, we're seeing that happen in AI as well. So from the uh, private sector or even the uh, academic community, it's already a global uh, initiative to co collaborate. But what about from government to government? Uh, I think there are a lot of people in Taiwan uh, who look uh, for us in the government to demonstrate the use of responsible AI. This is in stark contrast in many other countries. Uh, we did run actually uh, so-called alignment assemblies uh, with OpenAI, with Anthropic. The OpenAI uh, dialogue will be published, the finding will be published soon in a couple of weeks. And we, we see quite a bit of difference between the ones we run in Taiwan, we run one in Taipei, and one in Shaolin, in Tainan. Uh, their expectations to uh, the Taiwanese government versus the people in the U.S. I think many people in Taiwan see that because in the public sector we have now a guideline for the public service to use generative AI in a privacy preserving in a responsible way and because uh, we commit to public code and open source which means that uh, whatever we use in our ministry and also help other ministries use will be published as guidelines uh, for the industry. And so our science minister also announced uh, a few months ago that the science uh, council is training uh, Taito, right? So again, a fine-tuned llama that fits the local Taiwanese culture. And I think all these are the infrastructural work uh, that the governments must do. Uh, and when we say public code, it means both software code, but also regulatory code. And as we were talking before this meeting, our regulatory code may also be exportable uh, to other countries. But, but do, do you know how unusual this is? I, I live in America, I love America, love the country, love the people, but I, I don't think any, I just don't know any regulators in the US that would be fine tuning models on their laptops. And boy, it is so wonderful the US government provided leadership in, 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 in this way. I'm actually quite jealous. <laughs> I, I love America, but it's just the country is America Central comes to. Uh, he's one of the, not a few, the only in the world that, uh, you know, used to be hacker, but now the digital minister is the so, one and only. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but that leads to my next question that uh, th there should be some global initiative to co work together to develop AI, but should there be some local initiative too to develop our own, uh, whether it's a software applications? Because I remember there was an interview uh, done by Andrew yesterday, you mentioned that uh, for users who use a Chinese to set a prompt. Uh, the cost to, to, to process that will be different from the user who you send the English prompt. So because the computing power is different for the Chinese user, it will cost more. So it doesn't justify that kind of uh, you know, inequality. So should that be something that should, still needs to be done locally to kind of make uh, AI use pervasive in the future? Yeah, so I should just explain that a lot. I think um, there's one funny thing, I don't know. 
I don't think it's necessarily a huge effect, but it turns out that if you look at the global large language models provided by the you know, big tech companies, um, because those models are trained on a lot of English data and less Chinese language data, the, those models are optimized for English. And what that means is, um, if you were to take a concept and express it in English, versus take the same concept and express it in Chinese, then um, the large language models, because they charge per token, not really per word, it turns out that it will cost more for it to read some concept in, you know, say Chinese or a language with seen less data versus really read that concept in English. Um, and so on one hand, this seems unfair, right? Languages with less data on, on the internet, not just Chinese, but many low resource languages, languages with a lot of data on here. Why should people that speak those languages have to pay more to process their data? Um, on the flip side, this is actually when the AI system is trained on lots of English data, it's learned to be more sufficient, and so very rationally, it tries to optimize more for English data, which actually lowers carbon emissions, for example. So what's the right solution? I see different um, speakers in different languages, uh, uh, not just Chinese, but also say Japanese speakers and Korean speakers, all having conversations about, you know, do we need to train our own large language model with more language, of, of, with more data, of our own language. Uh, and, and what I'm actually seeing is that whereas there are a few mega-sized models, the 100 billion plus size models offered by Google, OpenAI, um, and, and, and Thropic and so on, I think we're migrating to a world where there's a huge range of models of lots of different sizes, including ones that specialize much more for specific tasks. Um, and, and I think, so I think it actually makes sense to certainly don't know if it makes sense for Taiwan to compete on the very largest models, but either through fine tuning, which is relatively inexpensive technology, or models of more modest sizes, it definitely makes sense for there to be a lot more specialized models trained in all sorts of places around the world, including Taiwan. Yeah, I think fine tuning, especially on the lower uh, level, the uh, lower rank data level, is a sweet spot that still uh, maintains some cultural translation, cultural understanding. Uh, aspects and uh, without the cost of the uh, pre-training stage. So that is the path that Haida is taking and we're also working with like new lab in NTU and so on and they're all probably using uh, the same um, ideas. And I would like to add one and that Mandarin is actually uh, comparatively, um, it is superiority here compared to other Taiwan's national languages. If you uh, speak to ChatGPT using Dai Yi, uh, the Tony Tolo, uh, it will uh, answer in Cantonese but uh, insist it's speaking Dai Yi. So it doesn't even know Dai Yi, right? So, so I think for Taiwan, especially next year as we're moving uh, to deploy AI technologies for uh, like long term healthcare and other uh, aging related technologies, uh, it is actually very difficult to convince people in their 90s uh, to start speaking perfect Mandarin. It's, it's not fair to, to them and their culture, uh, which is why we're also doubling down on investments to other national languages of Taiwan. And again, this is something we can do building upon the existing pre-trained uh, audiovisual and texture models. Okay, um, so here comes to my next question, because uh, AI research is now um, exploring the new frontier and basically open up an unknown area for you know all of us. And you know, in face of these kind of scenario, usually people will have two extremes sentiment. One is optimistic, like you know, the utopia. The other is you know, kind of pessimistic with fear, like you know, this terminate, terminator scenario. So it seems that more and more people now kind of sh uh, shift toward the uh, terminator. Scenario right now, given the uh, ChatGPT and other kind of Gen AI capabilities, so I am curious how you look at this and how to help people kind of you know quench their fear to, to kind of help them to switch to the optimistic <coughs> side. So, perhaps any no, suggestion? No, it's difficult. I think that um, so the reason I'm optimistic is because I think AI is making the world more intelligent. Um, I wish I was smarter, I wish, you know, I wish we're all, I, I wish there was more intelligence in the world to help us all make good decisions. And so AI seems to be bringing that, which is why I think directionally is a very positive thing for the world to be more intelligent. But of course, intelligence has some, you know, negative or, or even malevolent uh, evil use cases as well. And I think that, um, uh, I, th I see two things happening. One is the extinction risk, 
And I see elements of regulatory capture there, where many companies would much rather have regulators be um, banning AI from accessing nuclear weapons. Uh, this is actually being laws of being you know, discussed in the United States, to stop AI from accessing nuclear weapons. And it's not that I think AI should be allowed access to nuclear weapons, that's a really dumb idea, but I don't think any nuclear power has actually considered this. So from the perspective of some companies, it's much better to have regulators worry about access to nuclear weapons than say algorithmic transparency and the real issues that, that I think may affect businesses more, but are more important. So I see that as one thing. And the second part of it is, I think we need an honest conversation about jobs. Um, the reality is, um, so actually my, my team will often work with businesses to um, look at what people in a company are doing and take, it, it turns out AI does not automate jobs, it automates tasks. So we actually work with partners to analyze what are your employees doing, what is your workforce doing, and list out all the tasks they do to try to find a path for AI to either assist or augment some of the tasks. Let me share one example. We've talked a lot about, uh, we've, we've, we've heard about the application of AI to radiology, and it turns out when people think, how can AI help radiologists? People's minds often go to, oh, radiologists read x-rays. Let's see if AI can automate x-ray reading. Um, and we often think about the most defining task of the radiologist. But it turns out, if you look at the uh, uh, US government funded website, ONET, which breaks jobs down into tasks, radiologists do, I think, about 30 different tasks. They read x-ray images, they also communicate with patients, they have to gather patient histories, um, they have to operate the, the x-ray machines or the other imaging machines, they have to train young doctors, and on and on and on. And it turns out that I think there are tasks that are easier to automate than, you know, than the diagnosis task. But so what we find is, when we go into businesses and go through this exercise of finding out what do your 10,000 employees actually do, and what are the tasks, not jobs, but tasks, that are the most valuable to automate, is usually not the most obvious one. And usually, there's a way to do it in a way that um, creates value for the company and even enhances the job satisfaction of the employees. But the trick is, Sometimes jobs do go away, right? Today we don't have elevator operators anymore because of automatic elevators. So I think net net, um, most of AI would create a lot more value. And, and if you look at early ways of innovation, it turns out that while there are ways to save money, most businesses end up spending more of their time on growth because you can only save so much in cost, it's fun to do that, but growth is unlimited. So what's happening, I've seen this already, is even if a company starts with cost savings, you then you know, end up often spending more time on trying to drive revenue growth. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think AI is actually very beneficial for jobs as well. But the problem is, for a lot of people, if there's a 90% you know, chance of growth, a 10% chance I might lose my job. Well, you know, I'm kind of not sure I want that. Um, but I think we need those honest conversations about job impact, um, and, 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 and then I think hopefully with those honest conversations, we're going to be realistic, and I think it will turn out to be a more positive view of, of AI, uh, recognizing we do need to take care of people whose livelihoods are affected. So basically, it's not the jobs being replaced by AI, but the task has been redesigned due to AI. So that means people need to be retrained with new skills and capabilities. So there's one thing you mentioned the other day that uh, it's important to learn how to write code, build programs. Though, uh, given that we now can have the local code, code tools to help, but still it's important for people to learn how to write code programs. But how to make that happen, I mean, pervasively for the general public? Oh, so I think, um, so in the United States, there are four states out of 50 that already require coding or computing science uh, education in order to get a high school diploma. It's four right now, I hope it will soon be six, and Someday I hope we do all 50 things. But in, at least in the United States, there is significant regulatory momentum to, to require coding education. And I've been a you know, computer scientist all my professional life, but it was only in the last year that I felt like everyone should learn to code. And the reason is, um, everyone has data. Big companies have data, small companies have data. Even a high school student that just ran a biology experiment, they have data as well. And so AI has become much more valuable to individuals, not just software engineers, but you're a marketer, a recruiter, um, you know, business person. When you run a model possible, you have data. The other thing that's happened recently is with the local, local tools, actually more local actually, but generative AI, 
the barrier to building a custom AI on your own data is lower than ever before. But being able to write a little bit of code and use a large language model is still much more powerful than using a large language model. I think prompting is fantastic, and the idea that you can speak English or Chinese and just tell a computer what you want to get a result, that's fantastic. The problem with language is it's ambiguous, and so when you prompt an LM, what you get, you know, you often get what you want, but not what you want all the time. Whereas software code is unambiguous. You write a line of code, you get the same result every single time, pretty much. Which is why I think for the foreseeable future, someone that knows how to use AI, large language models, and knows just a little bit of code, they're going to do a lot more than someone that only knows how to use large language models. Um, which is why I would love to see a shift in the educational system from K-12 and up to help everyone learn just a little bit of coding, because I think that will empower individuals tremendously. Would you comment on this? Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, so before joining the cabinet, uh, I was at a uh, basic education curriculum uh, committee. Uh, in our new curriculum, we shifted the ideas of literacy, which is about consuming data and memorizing standardized sentences, uh, to competence or suyang, which is about making contributions uh, to the society, toward the common good. And the competence-based education is all about making pet projects making small projects uh, using local local system that has a uh, real local impact, uh, like air pollution sensing or contributing to larger fact-checking and so on. And with generative AI, we really see a change. Uh, like, uh, as I mentioned, we have this language model running on my own laptop. Uh, and the first thing that Silly Tavern installs is Coding Sensei, uh, which is a uh, kind of personalized uh, programming tutor, and just paste like system messages, error messages, whatever into it, and it does a kind of personal tutoring running entirely locally uh, to the person's uh, computer without worrying about the private data and so on not being transmitted to the cloud. And we're seeing that more and more educators are taking up this kind of interactive tutoring uh, mechanisms to make sure that students do not feel alienated when they see code. Uh, and um, like before joining the curriculum committee, I spent uh, many years working with Dan Brinkley. Uh, Brinkley is inventor of spreadsheets, the original BC Calc. And in his original vision, uh, it's always about spreadsheets being this assistive and social technology where everybody wears this kind of eyeglasses and we can see models and data floating in the air, maybe next year with Vision Pro that will actually happen. Uh, but the idea is that this is something social, a social object that people can comment on each other's spreadsheets and so on. And people just learn a little bit of formula uh, to get the spreadsheet going. But most importantly, people have the social capital to uh, get in touch with their local people also working on the same things to share their recipes and so on. So this kind of civic technology connections, I believe, is the fundamental societal infrastructure to any reskilling platform. And we're very happy to see that the Taiwanese uh, private sector is very much engaging with the civil society organizations, uh, including the AI Academy and so on, uh, for this kind of civic technology grassroots uh, organizations. Thank you. Uh, I have one more question before we move to the Q&A session. If you have any from the audience, uh, please scan the QR code and uh, send your questions. Um, AI development and application requires a lot of computing power. That means a lot of semiconductor chips, which Taiwan is very good at making. So uh, how, do Ty how does Taiwan develop the AI you know, capabilities based on the semiconductor strength? From you know, your, your opinion, start with uh, Andrew, then Audrey. Yeah. You know, so I think um, AI is going through a disruption in technology right now. So I know that maybe Taiwan doesn't feel like it's on the cutting edge of AI deep tech. And frankly, right now, a lot of the talent in deep tech AI is concentrated in just one place in the world, which is um, Silicon Valley. Because I think a lot of the, you know, a lot of the work uh, was done by people in OpenAI and Google. <coughs> and people left and started local companies. So the talent is very concentrated. But what I think is happening, what happened 10 years ago when deep learning you know, started to work really well, that was a great time for anyone to jump in. Uh, and a lot of people that jumped in at the start wound up leading and then doing really innovative work. So AI today, technology, is in that similar turmoil where all the rules are being rewritten. Some old technologies are less relevant, new things are being invented. So this is as good a time as any um, for you know, people in Taiwan to jump in and start building. 
And then also, I think <clears throat> uh, where Taiwan will have a unique advantage will be in building for the things where Taiwan is already strong. So for example, uh, precision manufacturing. If I want to build AI for precision manufacturing, I have no idea how I would do this in Silicon Valley because I just, you know, it just doesn't happen in Silicon Valley. But Taiwan has hundreds of companies that do precision manufacturing, and so it's going to be much more efficient for someone to do that work here in Taiwan. Or the way that Taiwan does insurance um, and financial services is different. So those are very unique projects to be done. I think the efforts of Taiwan to um, increase uh, English literacy, you know, that's not happening that many places in the world. So those are application sectors that could be uniquely advantaged to do in Taiwan, and I think those would be one set of opportunities. But also, just because of the disruption, this is as good a time as any to start um, leveraging the hardware ecosystem strengths to also build up the software industry. Oh, Jim? Yeah. Um, totally agreed. Um, I think, in particular, I'm excited about privacy enhancing technologies in the age of AI. Uh, more and more people are looking toward things that are truly zero knowledge, meaning that uh, if multiple hospitals train a federated learning AI or using split learning or whatever, they do not want to accidentally leak the private clinical data of just a few patients, because if that happens, this whole uh, industry's federated learning will be set back by years, right? So, uh, and with um, advanced generative AI, uh, the previous generation of de-identification, partial pseudonymization, and so on, doesn't work anymore. Uh, you can just feed it to a generative AI, and it will, more often than not, uh, just correctly guess the profile uh, of the hidden uh, fields. And so, a shift toward information theoretically secure, zero knowledge data sharing for collaborative learning. This is something that Taiwan can do. And thanks to our constitutional court ruling of the previous generation uh, of the universal healthcare uh, data reuse and so on, uh, we are now uh, setting up the highest standard uh, independent data protection authority. And my ministry uh, is currently in public consultation with many people uh, about uh, non-personal data altruism projects and also privacy enhancing technologies. Many of this will require advanced chip manufacturing to uh, have chips that accelerate zero knowledge proofs and other advanced mathematics. And once we have accelerators for that, then we solve this fundamental dilemma of uh, handing people with computation powers our data, but in encrypted form, so that they cannot look into our data, either running inference or other kind of training. And this is, I think, uh, where Taiwan should play a leadership role, uh, especially in APEC, where we hear from many uh, countries that they need something like that, but they currently do not have this um, coordination between the agencies to make this happen. Okay, thank you. Then we we'll start taking the first question. I think this one is related to lending AI. But the question is, uh, Taiwan has many tech companies that leverage AI technology to serve large uh, clients around the world, such as Foxconn and AUO Yoda. Uh, what are some major trends you see in this space that uh, Taiwan companies can uh, excel? Boy. It's a pretty broad question, but I think it means that uh, how do they leverage uh, the opportunity created by AI to incorporate into what they are doing right now? No, no, Probably no, no there's, yeah. there's a lot going on, and there's some technology going on, things we haven't publicized yet. Um, but I think that, um, I think this, what I'm seeing is, uh, you know, I, I showed the cost of gray detection thing just now. What some of our um, uh, customers have done is start off, for example, working with a quantum scale, large battery maker, um, and they start off with a smaller number of projects. Uh, in, in industrial in inspecting batteries, but then once the team gets to know the tools, I've been positively surprised at how quickly some once once a few people learn to build a vision system, they teach their buddies, and then they find other vision use cases, and then they teach their buddies, and so I've seen in many customers a proliferation of use cases where I would go, wow, I never thought of using um, computer vision in that way. And it's been interesting how, boy, you know, uh, I'm trying to think about that stuff. For example, there, there are a lot of tasks in inspection that people use the right rules about. Uh, for example, how do I find the part? You know, that's not an AI problem, it feels like. It feels like you can write a rule with more rules-based traditional vision. 
But I'm seeing that AI workflow is so easy that I'm seeing more and more teams use machine learning, or use supervised learning to do tasks you have other ways to do as well. Just to go to large language model, I have many ways to build a sentiment classifier, and using you know, ChatGPT 3.5 maybe is overkill, but it's so convenient, I'm going to do it anyway. I see this in good division where one customer needs to find out if an image is out of focus. This is a real example. Um, there are ways to write a bunch of software to tell the image is out of focus, but they said, Forget it. I'm not going to go figure out how to do that. I'm just going to have a machine algorithm learn to tell my pictures out of focus. And maybe it's a little bit overkill to train a huge neural network just to tell the pictures out of focus. But the workflow was so easy, it made it very efficient for, for someone with a low code experience to just get the job they needed done and then move on to the next one. So it's been exciting to see the proliferation of applications. Okay, next question is to Audrey, but this is a much broader one. Uh, what's the national AI strategy for Taiwan? So this, again, going to be a three-day conference. Uh, so I, I'll just skip that one to the next one. Uh, how to align Taiwan's uh, AI talent to the global de AI development, in your opinion? Yeah, um, so I, I, I still can talk a little bit about AI strategy. Um, I think uh, our strategy is mostly about democratic alignment. Democratic meaning that instead of just a few data centers holding all the AI powers, we want to invest in the kind of technology that enabled edge AI, community scope AI, um, company scope AI, and so on, uh, based largely on fine tuning uh, technologies. And this infrastructure level investment will make sure that people closest to the pain points can use AI as assisted, uh, assisted intelligence, like my eyeglass. Um, you know, if there's bias, if it's not transparent and something, uh, I know how it works, I can fix it, I can tune it myself or send it to a repair person down the street. Uh, whereas if this is a, you know, monoculture centralized, sending all the photons to the cloud process and then to my retina, then I would have no visibility into how it works, nor the ways to tune it. So democratization in the way that Andrew just described, which is for each industry to consider its own use cases, I think this is definitely part of our strategy. And the other part is, as you mentioned, the local talents. I think we want to make sure that what we're developing is aligned uh, with at least the democracy um, world, the democratic alliance, with its respect on um, uh, privacy, dignity, fairness, transparency, and so on. So toward the end of the year, when my institute, the Cybersecurity Institute, sets up the assurance framework uh, for AI, we want to make sure that we're compatible with not just the US NIST RMF uh, AI framework, but as many frameworks internationally as possible, so that our local talent working on the products and services aligned to our local assurance framework will also work uh, in other jurisdictions in other countries. And so we want to create a global market where the uh, common concerns the, like transparency and so on are honored in an international fashion as part of the technical standard, and then the local concerns and so on can be added on using fine tuning. Can I add one thing to that? Yeah. There's one thing I'd love to see. Um, so you know, even though the world feels fragmented sometimes when we joke on the whole point of view, um, when I was at a division conference in uh, Canada earlier this year, in, in, uh, uh, it was interesting how people from all around the world, all nations, um, from, <coughs> including from US, China, other places in Asia, um, places in Europe, people just got together and talked about technology and shared ideas. And I think today, um, people, well, people matter. And I think those connections and people getting together really matters. One thing I really enjoyed uh, previously was the um, X talent program, uh, those pre and its predecessors that Edward David had been instrumental to setting up, had sent some Taiwanese engineers to my team at the iPhones, and we really enjoyed working with those Taiwanese engineers that then later came back to Taiwan. But I feel like those programs, um, certainly among the AI developer talents, uh, uh, to build bridges and build relationships are really important. In fact, well, and Eva Wang, you know, who works closely with me at the iPhone, um, uh, is from Taiwan, right? She's telling me about stories about when she grew up here, you know, when, when she was young. So I think those bridges and those people moving back and forth um, really help. And, and programs like X Talent, I think, actually are, are a huge contributor to that as well. Yeah, it's just one very quick word on the talent circulation back part. Uh, we co designed uh, with Vitaly Bordering uh, our new uh, Taiwan digital gold card, which means that anyone with 
open source uh, contribution, not necessarily code, it could be documentation or blog, uh, for eight years automatically qualify uh, for a gold card, which is three years of open work permit, universal healthcare, and so on in Taiwan. It was quite popular actually during the pandemic before our ministry started for people. Many of my friends in Silicon Valley used the gold card to be in Taiwan. But now we're seeing not just from Silicon Valley, but for uh, around the world, like uh, in the Ethereum world, many of them are actually from uh, Latin America and so on. As long as they can prove they contributed to open source, and most of Foundational AI is open source for uh, eight years. They automatically qualify, and we want them to circulate to Taiwan and build a good relationship so that our local talent can work on a global landscape uh, working with these circulating talents. And you're making me jealous again. <laughs> <laughs> the one and the only in the world right now, this is uh, only in Taiwan. So the next is a, a pretty practical question. Uh, we, we didn't stage this at all. So he likes to know the progress of the AI fund, which you help to manage. And also, as a local entrepreneur here in Taiwan, he likes to know how to connect to that fund. <laughs> sure, thank you. So I think, boy, um, you know, I just, you know, I think AI fund, um, so I feel like what we've learned a lot over the last four or five years was um, fine tune the build process. So I think AI fund is a venture studio. To be completely honest, we had a slow start. That's pretty my biggest regret with AI funds. And in the first couple of years, you know, because we're a venture studio, we don't just invest in companies. We like to find entrepreneurs to build the company with them and then we invest in it. And so it took us a while to hire our own team. And then after we started our own team, we then started to build companies before we could then invest in the companies. So, but I think that over the last four or five years, I've been really delighted at how we went from, frankly, Kind of too slow, which is my mistake. To now, um, we're expecting to do 13 companies this year, um, and hopefully even more next year. And I, maybe some days I wake up and go, "Wow, this really works!" Like you know, we wake up, we go through the process that I showed, and we end up able to find and support entrepreneurs that build really exciting companies. Um, so some days I wonder, "Wow, we're really lucky to stumble on this process." So for, uh, like the armor ride, the like, Nation. I think I, I said we announced it. So that company we funded back in April, I think, and then two and a half months later, um, Renate had a support capital in the next round of funding, which is what we announced this morning. But it's like this engine is really working. It's pretty exciting. Oh, one of the things I learned early on working in AI, my, my PhD thesis was flying helicopters. One of the cool things about working in AI, if any of you are considering career in AI, this is the one cool thing about AI is. Um, you get to play with all sorts of things. So as an AI person, I have flown autonomous helicopters. I've learned how to read um, uh, you know, EKGs, and I've come up with doctors. Um, and, you know, uh, and I've also worked on global maritime shipping, and I've learned really cool things about relationships. One of the really cool things about working AI, if any of you are trying to pick a career path as an AI person, you get to play with so many fascinating things. So AI fun, he is very fun, because we just get to do all this amazing stuff. Just a follow-up question. Uh, what advice would you have for entrepreneurs in Taiwan who are planning to venture into the generative AI? Is it too late now? Um, the advice to for the local entrepreneurs who are planning to venture into the generative AI, is it too late now? Oh, what a good question. And heavens, no, absolutely not too late. Um, I think actually very early. I, I've gotten this from people in, 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 in the US as well. They asked, hey, Andrew, am I late? To generate AI, but no, we're just getting started. And I remember, um, you know, with, with the rise of deep learning, the first few years, but the first few years was a fantastic time to jump in. A lot of people to jump to deep learning around 2014, 2015, just did groundbreaking work because they were the first person that saw a problem or got to apply deep learning to an application. And I think certainly right now, the number of opportunities to apply generative AI is much larger than the number of highly skilled teams that are able to execute those projects. In fact, AI Fund, we wound up with so many ideas, we just couldn't keep track of it. We had a Google Doc, we just started by the other startup idea, and it got so messy, we just could not keep track. So today, AI Fund, we use a task management software, we actually use Asana to keep track of our ideas. And every time I pull up my phone and pull up Asana, there's so many ideas, so many good ideas. And we get ideas from Fortune 500 CEOs, you know, and we just go, yeah, thank you, but 
but even better ideas that need to prioritize even more highly. So there's so many ideas and such a lack of people working on them. And so I think that this is a fantastic time to jump in. Oh, the other day I was also chatting with um, the CEO of Appier, uh, who, 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 was my, who was my student. And I think starting the Taiwan market um, with the unique strengths and potentially growing global, and Appier was a red unicorn now listed in Japan. I think actually a lot of those opportunities that have yet to be built in, in Taiwan. And I was excited to hear of the progress in Appier because I know people are wondering, can it be done? Now it obviously can be done, and I look forward to entrepreneurs in Taiwan you know, just doing great companies like that. I got two more questions uh, before I wrap up this uh, Q&A session. Uh, one is uh, about the uh, AGI and the other is about UBI. Okay, so for the AGI part, um, there are two teams right now um, competing for the artificial general intelligence. One is a big mic, which just recently acquired the, the Google uh, brain. And I think they merged the team together in the UK, led by uh, Ben Hassabis. And the other is Sam Ottoman, OpenAI. So uh, I'd like to get your views on both these two. Which, which one has a better shot? In your opinion. <laughs> no, I like Sam and Dennis, they're both great. I think I think it's early, frankly. You know, um, maybe just, just to give uh, Sam and OpenAI credit, a lot of friends in OpenAI, and uh, the people in OpenAI, these are my friends, I know they tell them, they really care. They're really trying to, you know, bring intelligence, do it in a safe way. I know that, and, and, and just to give um, the Google team credit too, I know that both companies have sometimes had flack, saying, hey, you don't care, you're not responsible, blah, blah, blah. Among my friends in these companies, they really care and they're really trying to do the right thing. I'm not saying that big tech companies are perfect. Definitely big tech companies have had some massive screw-ups. Um, but uh, maybe I'll say, the one place where big tech companies tend to screw up is when the clear economic interest of the company runs opposite you know, to what we would consider responsible, uh, which is maybe a massive caveat. Uh, but, but I do see that my friends in OpenAI and in Google, they really care, and there have definitely been many times when, you know, there was PR saying whatever that I felt was unfair relative to what I knew the hearts of my friends were. Um, but you asked me about AGI, I think we're early, I think we're so far away, um, unless you change the definition of AGI. There's some definition, my, my friend Eric Grinnelson, he was saying, well, if that's the definition of AGI, I think we got there 30 years ago. So, Depending on how you define AGI, I think it's, it's hard to say. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can uh, pass the Turing test without being aware that you passed the Turing test. Uh, and so, uh, just to add very quickly uh, on the AGI question, uh, I think it matters less what we call AGI. What we do care is whether the first ones that, in narrow fields, uh, supersedes um, human judgment speed there, things like that. I mentioned cybersecurity and many other areas. We want to care that how aligned are the first frontier models. If they start up as misaligned because of misaligned incentives, like if the first one is to build addiction to touch screens, uh, that actually happened, uh, <laughs> then the societal impact is so negative that we will have to spend then 10 years to try to uh, get some liability from what can. But if the first in any given domain, whether it's through so-called superintelligence or uh, supernumerosity in a narrow field, it starts as aligned, then we have a better way for it to kind of coach the up and coming models to be also aligned in similar ways. So I think investment in uh, super alignment and also alignment in general, I think is very important. And just follow up on that, uh, since Audrey, uh, although you're the one and the only digital minister, in the world, but uh, you, you, you pay a lot of attention to social innovation in the past, I'm, I'm sure still now. So, because Sam Ottoman uh, himself uh, had, did an interview with the New York Times earlier this year and expressed that uh, despite there might be millions of jobs being taken or replaced by AI, but there are going to be trillions of dollars of wealth to be made from the AGI if it's become real. Um, so, his idea is to redistribute the wealth to create a, to, to make the, um, the universal basic income, the UBI possible. I'd like to get your views on that. So is that the AGI or the development of AI gonna bridge the gap between the haves and have-nots, or is it gonna widen the gap? 
Yeah, well, Sam also has an idea where everybody on Earth uh, should democratically align AI to uh, express our preferences in a coherent, blended volition, uh, so that superintelligence intelligence knows that when they put humanity first, exactly what does that mean? Uh, and it can be done in a continuously uh, democratic way. Uh, I think that is a really good vision, uh, and the same way that this kind of democratic alignment require grassroots social innovators. I understand OpenAI is working with, say, the v Taiwan community in Taiwan and so on, uh, completely grassroots. Uh, I think that answers also the UBI question, right? So this is not just a few regulators saying that we're going to do this UBI tomorrow, but rather uh, just looking at the societal indicators, uh, which kind of sectors are vulnerable, which ones are not currently covered by the reskilling and social safety needs and so on and they redistribute meaningfully uh, money toward uh, that particular sector. So I think this kind of dynamic or continuous democracy is really needed, instead of waiting for four years or 10 years in order to do a completely census and so on, we need this kind of social evaluation of impacts, both uh, uh, upsides and negative ones, and also to dynamically just get a consensus on what to do after that. Now, um, I think using AI to facilitate this kind of uh, democratic conversation, that has been my research subject for most of my uh, career. Uh, and I think it is really good that we see not just Google and OpenAI, but also Meta and Anthropic and so on, all investing in a similar way to use AI to enable facilitation on a grassroots level that improves the democratic processes. So, uh, thank you. Andrew, you were a teacher to Sam when he was at Stanford. So what about your comments or views on the UBI that he promised to deliver in the future? I think UBI is a good idea. I'm not sure we need it for a while, because for a long time, there'll be plenty of work for humans to do. Um, and I think uh, large investment in reschooling to make sure people have the skills they need to keep on contributing, that seems more important to me for the short term. If we get to AGI 50 years from now, and there's a large fraction of the population, they can add no economic value. I think that, that would be a strong signal we need more of a UBI at that time, but we're actually still you know, quite far away from that. Okay, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Audrey. Uh, I think they both express and share the, uh, the insight with us regarding the uh, development of AI and uh, you know, also the concerns we need to address. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please give them. Thank you. Thank you.